I'm Beth Dickstein, co-founder of Be Original Americas. Our last fellowship presenter is a person who's almost always first. Primo Apilia, co-founder of Studio O Plus A in San Francisco, was the first architect, designer, and multidisciplinary firm to join Be Original Americas beyond the manufacturers who are key. His courage and leadership is some of the reasons for the growth and the importance of this advocacy group, advocacy group. Taking what the crisis dealt, Primo will show us new space types and typologies of our workplaces that shape work going forward. A winner of the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Award for Interior Design in 2016, Primo has created groundbreaking designs for such firms as Nike, Microsoft, McDonald's, Facebook, Slack, and I could go on. He's really an agent of change, and I am so pleased and so proud to introduce you to Primo. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, thank you all the original uh, students for joining today. Um, First off, I, I just want to thank B Originals and what they're doing. Um, I think part of why we wanted to be a part of it is that design, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it is a lot of original thinking. Obviously, we specify furniture, but I think today it would be great to kind of talk about, you've seen all the really beautiful images and pictures and things that Opasse does, but I want to kind of let you into the inside thinking. Some of the things that we do behind the scenes that aren't so apparent um, we're going to look at. But I thought first we'd start off by looking at, you know, a couple of experimental projects that inform our work. So, uh, Lisa, if you're on, why don't we run the first video? It is of a pop-up store that we did in South Carolina that we curated for a month. And each week we changed the end user. And we wanted to think about what if you could change your space? Uh, what would the attributes of the product be? What would you, you know, how would that manifest itself? So we recorded a month long stay of five, uh, four different individuals using the space, a taxidermist, a toy designer, a graphic designer, and a architect. So, you know, why do we do these interventions and investigations? We do them because we want to understand what we do is create experiences. And what way, you know, can you get interaction? Can you motivate people? Um, we simply took the brief and we said, we need to understand, you know, what people are doing in this space. And if we gave them a set of, or a kit of parts, would they, would they be interested in moving it around themselves? So the brief was really, you know, use the space for a month and OPLUS A use it as an opportunity to kind of investigate new ways of working and make it fun. Um, all those boxes there, you can't buy them anywhere. We made them, we color coded them, we created rubber bands and, and, and woven binding devices for, for simply the reason we wanted to give it flexibility and, and, and no hard, no, nothing was difficult to put together. So. That, that was just one project. We've got lots of little experimental projects. So that to me is like O plus A's experimental end. And our process was to create something that was flexible and um, movable. And then the next project I'm gonna show you is Slack. Everybody probably knows who Slack is, uses the Slack channel. 
Um, part of this was to really understand the end user. And what was interesting to them was that the founder was a hiker and he equated hiking and the, 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 the sort of like the rules and philosophy of a hiker of showing people around, of exploration, of taking a second look as what would inform the design. So let me show you how our team um, sort of recognize those features and how we built a concept around the trail. We specifically use the Pacific Crest Trail as sort of our main concept, guiding you through the 14 stories of the building. People always ask me to explain design, especially as it applies to interiors. We're trying to create experiences, memorable experiences. Slack is one of those clients that understands the importance of design and how you can really convey meaning and ideas through it. How do we want to work with our colleagues? How do we want to work with our fellow designers or, or programmers or developers? Well, we want to bring them along. The trail is all about discovery. The way that you go through a trail is that you are willing to kind of put yourself out there and make a choice between going left or right. No map was going to ever get you through this. <laughs> You're gonna to have to go and discover it yourself. We're on a journey. The trail becomes a very real design tool for us. From desert to the high plains and underneath the canopy, you can have this movement through the space. If you meet somebody along the way, hopefully you kind of take them along. I think design helps people do the things they need to do. So whether it's focus, whether it's rest, whether it's socializing with your friends, you know, I think it helps create the perfect moment for something to happen. So that shows you a little bit of uh, the inside story of Slack. And now what we're gonna do is, is kind of pivot over to kind of what is behind all those beautiful spaces. Um, o plus A is not only a very kind of accomplished design practice, but we're also workplace strategists. We think about the experience, we think about the sequencing, we think about how people move through the space. And then this pause, of a year of like looking at the workplace and working from home um, over a year now, O plus A has spent time thinking about what should the return to work um, scenario look like? Um, will it be working from home? Will it be working at a little satellite office or even the coffee shop close to your house? Or is the office um, this labyrinth of connected spaces? In, in a lot of ways, um, the workspace has expanded. Um, we've always known we could work from home, but now we've had focus time. We've always known we could work at remote workplaces, but now we you know, like entertain them because we don't wanna work in our house all day. And we also know we can go back to the headquarters. So all these moments need to be compelling. All those reasons we go there need to be compelling. So what you didn't see in all those fabulous spaces in the Slack project is that each one of those spaces has a different use, a different function. And it's no different in, in the post-COVID world, we're gonna have to rethink the way we use spaces, the way people enter spaces and the purpose of that space because we may be working remotely most of the time and we may not have a desk that we need to go to. So we've developed some thinking around how we should approach coming back to work. So the next slide is, let's go listen to the next one, is really just to give you the journey of O plus A. Uh, this is our, 30th year, if you can believe that, of designing spaces. 
we had a topologies book that came out, I would say about 2014. And it was truly about agile work and typologies that OPLUS-A developed. Um, conference rooms or war rooms, kitchen, kitchenettes, uh, all types of spaces that you saw in the Slack video. And then during COVID, we, we thought about when we return to work, we need to have some ideas and some plans for people to return to work. So we developed the toolkit for the times, which is downloadable for free. And it, it basically tells the designer, what are the things you need to study and put in place in order to come back to work from the sidewalk all the way up to your space. And then we've been doing a lot of research. Obviously, there's been a lot of articles published. We've categorized them, created a bibliography, looked at equipment. You need to have a certain amount of research to kind of inform these designs. And now we're looking at what we're doing now, workplace now, the new typologies, the spaces that are gonna help us as we return to work. Next slide. So one of the things you're gonna, you know, I think we're all a little bit apprehensive about coming to work. So we try to understand it from a very kind of empathetic point of view. We want our empathetic point of view. We wanna understand, you know, what are the feelings? What are the behaviors? What are the environment, cons environmental considerations uh, for coming back? And the whole idea that we miss being social in the space with our colleagues. Next slide. We've looked at a couple of key things that I think are um, going to be crucial. Um, connection, uh, people miss being with each other. So that social interaction is crucial. Communication, we wanna make sure that we're communicating a lot of different things about well-being, um, neurodiverse spaces, inclusive spaces, uh, transparency. It's really important that we maintain a high level of transparency because people are a little bit cautious about returning to work. So we need to emphasize things like cleaning, um, we need to show that we're doing the things to kind of make our employees and people feel safe. Empathy, above all. We kind of know that this is a very difficult time. This is a very hard time for some people to return to work. And some people want to, you know, they're, they're anxious, but they are being cautious. Education, we, we really need to talk about what are the things that we need to do to make clear rules and regulations on how we can make the space safe so people want to come back to work. And we need to show trust, we need to create that trust. Um, if we show order, if we show cleaning, if we show methods that show that the space has been dealt with uh, on a daily basis, people will begin to trust the environments again. Right now, there's not a lot of trust. Next slide. Greenery, we know that biophilic design, um, it's got so many positive attributes. Um, we are very kind of like aware of this and have some you know, in some spaces have dealt with it, but it's gonna become more as anxiety and stress. All these things that we've noticed um, are, go are, are going to be dealt with in the environments. Uh, flexibility, we need to make sure that we create choice. Choice is what we may not have had in the past in terms of working from home or remotely. It is now obvious that that choice is a selection that people are gonna take, but we also need to make sure the choices in the office are even better even more comfortable, even more uh, you know, in tuned with what we need in terms of health and well-being. Visibility, there needs to be a clear line of what's going on. I always say that office spaces need to be very legible, very understand, understood, but when an end user walks in, um, so we need to make things visible. We have relationships and we're craving, we need to kind of make sure to cultivate those. And we need to make sure that we don't change the office so much that it's unfamiliar. Um, we know that it is real easy to kind of just turn about and try to do things all new and fresh, but that creates stress. So we don't wanna totally redesign. And areas of respite, um, people need time to disconnect. Um, a walk around the park, something built into this space is what we're talking about, just in case you can't get access outside. So um, I want you guys to think about these things, ask questions. We will be doing a question and answer after this, uh, but these are just some um, more on the psychology of returning to work that we're gonna talk about. And now let's kind of go into some of the solutions that we've come up with. I'm sorry, we're gonna do a couple more things. These are kind of the facts that we're, you know, this is what workplace is looking like today. 74% um, miss the workplace. Um, the sweet spot for return to work is going to be in the two to three days a week that, you know, you are going to probably come into the office. Uh, choice is very important. That's what matters. So people want to make sure their quality of life 
They understand what it's like to be home and around their families and want to have that choice as an option. About 30% are going to be um, adopting hybrid remote work styles is what we're seeing on companies and an average. Um, we know that um, the workforce is uh, kind of uh, most, most, mostly finance companies, about 5% will move to this hybrid work style. Uh, unassigned seating in environments is looking like it's going to be 100%. We may not have a desk that is our own when we come back. It may be an assigned desk during that day. Um, we're seeing a little bit of reduction in head count from, um, you know, as being studied to align uh, with this remote work style, 30 to 50%. And um, U.S. consumers say that health, mental health, and physical health is a top priority, 86% in the return to the workplace. So we need to make healthy spaces that deal with various diversity, uh, neurodiversities. Um, so the kind of the top considerations are 100% on the sign. Number two is flexible office, so scheduling. Number three is technology is gonna be integrated more heavily so we know where our colleagues are. And companies are looking um, really, really hard at the erosion of culture. Um, we built these great environments to cultivate and create culture. And now the big concern is, is it gonna erode if we don't have so much time in the office. Next slide. So we've looked at a number of ways at identifying how do we design this new space? A um, couple of personas that we've come up with. Uh, persona A, I come to work to the office primarily to utilize the office amenities uh, that I don't have at home. Or persona B, I come to the office primarily for mentorship and professional development. Or persona C, I come to the office primarily for space that supports focused work and less distractions. Or persona D, I come into the office primarily to get better technology and ergonomic help. Uh, persona E is I come into the office primarily for impromptu collaboration, socializing, and feel a sense of community. Or persona F, I come into the office primarily for scheduled meetings. Or persona G, I come into the office primarily uh, because I'm new and I want to learn about company, company culture and I want a sense of belonging. So we know that these could be mixed. There's not just one A or there's a, could be A, B, A, B, E, so these can be combined, but these are kind of the reasons people are thinking about what, 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 what it is that draws them to the workplace. Next slide. Um, again, this is sort of a reiteration of in-person collaboration. We've identified that, and then we actually have virtual collaboration, such as the Zoom meeting, what we're doing today. And then one of the big needs is health and wellness. So these are kind of three key factors that we've begun designing space around. Next slide. So with these, um, we're beginning to see some new things sort of appear um, in person collaboration. Um, we need some new solutions. Um, we know we do indoor and then we know we might need outdoor. So we are starting to flex the office into other areas. Uh, virtual collaborations. Uh, while Zoom is great, there are probably some better methods, uh, maybe rooms that are more set up for it, uh, maybe impromptu uh, serendipitous opportunities that can happen. So virtual collaboration isn't so set up, but it is actually more serendipitous and accidental. Um, so we need to set up old moments like that. Um, adaptable. We need to have real easy access to that tech so it's not hard to get at. Health and wellness. Um, you know, we've got new methods to enter the building. We've got new areas of rest. We'll go over them in detail, but these are some of the defining programs that we want to integrate into the new workplace. So this diorama of different type of spaces is really, uh, if you look at it closely and sort of zoom in, um, it encompasses the typologies that we talked about, and it encompasses many more typologies many more spaces. Um, they are very, very much about how do, we, how do we move people through space, make them feel comfortable in this new post-COVID world. Um, we need to kind of be very thoughtful of what those spaces look like, um, their function, and, and the new experiences to make people feel safe. The indoor-outdoor quality, um, the movement through, uh, all these things are are, are going to change. They're changing as we speak. And, and you're the generation that is gonna be thinking about these problems and solving them. And I wanted you to kind of see 
amongst all the designs that O plus A has done, um, the underpinnings and what happens behind the scenes is as important, if not more, because they are the basis on which we design. And these spaces, and they have to have, first of all, a, a, a usability and function and experience to them uh, that people may not even know what it is, but they'll feel it. And that's kind of what I feel true design is. You don't necessarily need instructions. You just know how to do it because the space is very legible and very understandable and very logical. The most well-designed space is the space that sort of melts away and you didn't even know you're working. And the idea is very much that, that when you come in, the right conference room, the right silent space, the right audium is there at your beck and call. So you have the choice. And, and, and now you have the choice to work from home. So we want to make sure that we integrate that typology as well. So thank you very much. And I think we'll go into questions and answers now. Perfect, Primo, thank you so much for sharing those insights. Just to quickly introduce myself to the audience. My name is Alyssa Young. I work as the director of Be Original Americas. We're gonna jump into audience Q&A. So definitely send your questions in for Primo. Again, you can find that Q&A button either at the top or bottom of your screen. First question we have is, what do you think companies can do to help give the remote staff as good of an experience as in office staff? I, I do. I actually think that that is kind of the next world that we need to make sure that your experience is, um, you know, going to be as comparable as to what you have in the workplace. So we want to make the office um, at your home safe. We want to create boundaries. Um, there is a concern that if you have your office there every day, uh, that you won't take time to take breaks. You won't take time for yourself. So there is that danger. But we also know that, you know, with some protocols and with some rules um, that we can actually make sure to, to monitor that and, and make people utilize the function of their home office in the correct way um, and not just continue to work all hours of the night. You can pick the hours if you want to work late at night, but you should also take time and maybe have something that alerts you said, you've worked for over eight hours, you really need to take a break. Uh, maybe the desk is automated and changes height and it reminds you. Uh, but that is a real concern is that, well, we just brought the office closer to home and we're trying to take a break from the office. That's why you didn't have a home office. And now we're putting it directly into your daily routine. Uh, I think there needs to be rules and regulations about how we use that um, so that we don't feel like we're overwhelmed by the workplace invading our space. Right. We've had one student write in, I'm trying to imagine a creative studio with only floating desks. What do you think will replace the wall space or personal bulletin boards or whiteboards that typically host post-its, sketches, mood boards, et cetera? Um, you know, that's a great question. And I think that, you know, we're, we're kind of exploring um, some virtual spaces uh, that actually, that will be one of the typologies. I think um, there's a generation out there that is gonna be fine working in almost a gamified world where you can have zero gravity, or you can have post and notes float in space. Um, the physical space is never gonna be replaced. And I think there's always that important, that moment where you need to meet people, but maybe there is something online in a screen in a world that you can have exactly what you're saying, sort of this wall-less environment where you can just throw post-it notes or ideas. Um, and manipulate it and, 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 and do your daily check-ins through that. Uh, the physical space, um, you know, we're kind of like that idea that we showed you in South Carolina with the pretend stores. Like if we gave you a bunch of pieces to create your ideal environment, you probably would do it. And that's what we tell clients that you need to give your employees the ability to kind of move and flex and create their own work areas. Um, people, like to create spaces that fit them. And if you give them the pieces to do that, like you're saying, this place where you don't need whiteboards, you invent you know, whatever it is you feel you need to create that environment. So it's very customized to you. I currently work where most of the staff works in one open space with cubicles. 
offices with doors line the perimeter. So there are only windows for people who have private offices. There are so many people working within this one relatively small space. What are some uh, of the challenges and solutions to designing for small spaces? For example, buildings in New York with limited space. I think you need to understand, um, I mean, a little bit of that sounds a little, um, a little older version of workplace when you have perimeter offices and you have the workstations sort of in the middle away from the windows. Newer office design really doesn't even put offices in for individuals. It puts it in for conferencing, phone booths, what I would call communal uses. Um, but if we do have offices, I try to take them off the, the wall or the window line so that natural light can be shared by everybody. It is a little bit of a hierarchical thing. It is sort of an old school thing to put office windows. And um, that is a little bit what, you know, to me is like what led to open plan and the explosion of it is like, we wanted these very democratic um, sort of egalitarian spaces. Uh, but then all of a sudden they became too noise and loudy, loud because people didn't put enough rooms. So there's a balance. What I say is that I need to kind of like look and see kind of the programming. And then if you can, if you can enlighten the managers and executives that, that you know, the light and the space should be shared, uh, maybe you can turn some of those offices into conference rooms so you can get access to it. Smallest off, smaller offices are difficult. I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to know when to stop adding workstations and make sure that you have the proper amount of phone rooms, conference rooms, lounge spaces, because you can work from those. You don't need a desk. You can work from any one of those positions. Our devices are smaller, faster, they have Wi-Fi. So you have to take a, a more radical approach to opening up the office and not just think of it in terms of a desk and a office. Absolutely. What if your office doesn't have outdoor space? How can they create a nature related environment? That, that's actually easier than you would think. Um, in a couple of environments, we have simply just created a plant almost like a little greenhouse within the office space. Uh, it could be a room that has shelves that you can get lots of leafy plants in. Maybe it has access to natural light so it's not inboard but it's actually a perimeter uh you can create what i would say almost like the greenhouse effect in a space in a conference room and just put the furniture in the middle and live within the, you know kind of the biome the biophilic elements uh, we, we do a lot of conference rooms in the office where we surround the entire perimeter in plants and we put the conference table in the middle so it feels like a terrarium so you can do it real easily by just planting Absolutely. That sounds like a lovely meeting room. <laughs> what role do you think virtual reality will have in an office life? I think it's going to be a choice. I think it's going to be a real choice. I think we're, you know, Zoom is just kind of at the tip of that. I think um, we are already seeing that uh, there, there is something about e the equality in a Zoom meeting. Everybody's the same size. Everybody's voice can be heard. You can raise, you can control it. There's no there's no, it's almost a very flattened organization. I think in the same way you can do that in the, in the, in the gaming world, you can kind of create virtual environments uh, where you could be a different self. It could be an avatar or it could be a complete replication of yourself. And then you can share a meeting space and it's very equal. Um, it's, there, there's something about um, the, the gamification of the workplace that is intriguing because there's a whole generation that is very used to it. Um, and I think they will take to it really easily and it will be productive. Uh, what we're trying to do is to kind of just set environments in supportive spaces. And if that happens with a headset on, that's fine. It makes no difference. To me, it's all about choice. My, I may choose not to do that because I'm terrible at gaming, but <laughs> there are gonna be guys who know everything about it and they're gonna go, wow, these options are limitless and I wanna work in that environment. So they'll take to it quite easily. So I do think it's a big, it's a, there's a big future in that. How does the Grove environment that you shared with us work in inhospitable climates? Well, I think it's a simulation. And I think the idea is that in, you know, let's say your worst winter in the middle of the middle of the United States, you want some greenery, you want some, some natural biophilic elements. Um, there have been studies where simple color changes and greenery can really help.
help your mental state of mind. So again, I think you need to just dedicate a room or a space or a, make a bigger effort to bring planting in. Um, make sure you have those really good filters uh, in the workspace. So you're kind of always circulating the air and cleaning it and cleansing it. Um, there's a lot of things you can do and maybe dedicate a room that has its own HEPA filter or whatever filter just so the air has been run through a filter 29 times before you step in there and it has plants. And plants do a lot to scrub the air. People don't realize they act as scrubbing devices as well. Uh, I just saw an installation of this hanging wall system that runs fans behind it and draws the air through the plants and pushes it back out and uses the filtering effects of biophilic design or biophila biophilia to cleanse the air. It's out there, the tech's out there, it just hasn't been readily used. Um, so you, you're, you're the generation that can start installing and design those. I mean, O plus A is gonna try to get it done, but you guys can start implementing those ideas as well. <laughs> That's really interesting and I think leads nicely into our next question. During the pandemic, the contributions and experiences of essential workers have come to the forefront. How can the future workspace better support and provide a safe workspace for the background staff like cleaners, cafeteria workers, and so on? Yeah, I, I agree that to me, it's like when, when we create a work environment, it, it is from everybody who's in the space should have access to all the audiums, the circadian rhythm lights, the elements of respite, and even just to have a home cooked meal or a space to retreat to needs to feel welcoming. Um, and it's always been about that. You want really inclusion, not just say we have a policy, but you want to invite the people in who are a part of that environment who are part of that supportive structure to feel a part of the company. So there needs to be spaces, not tucked away in corners, but in direct light, the sight line of everybody. And they need to be shared. Um, the, the wonderful thing about open office is it was supposed to be all shared space. If, if I made a choice on a break to go sit in an audium or arboretum, I would have the freedom to do that. So, you know, you need to try not to create any class levels. And I agree. So first responders, spaces that they retreat to need to be well-designed, you know, whether it's a fire station or a ambulance company or a police station or a hospital, those moments of respite are vital. And we don't often do enough to make them as exciting, as compelling and as relaxing uh, and responsive as they, they might be. Um, but I do think that's changing, um, but that, that's a great question. And I do think that we've always designed environments to be all inclusive. And, and we just need to kind of make sure that that is the case and that we need to design better environments for all those people as they were in the first responder in those workspaces that they come from. What are a few key things companies do, big or small, to encourage employees to come into a workspace that accommodates them in this new era. Do you think there's a difference between, uh, sorry, do you think there's a difference for those varied size companies? So um, that kind of goes back to those studies and why people want to come back. Um, we're kind of looking at that real closely because as the model for the new workplace evolves into this hybridized workspace, we are thinking of what would be the reason why you know, I would just rather zoom in and not jump into a bus or my car or an Uber to get to the office. Um, people are still needing physical contact with people. Um, there are things and collaboration and laughter and moments that only can be experienced in person. So can we make those spaces the perfect backdrop for that, that facilitate those conversations? And I think we can. I think there are some things that we can certainly do from home really well. And there's things that the office can only do. Uh, and that is bring people together. And that is to share ideas from different departments. Uh, tech can aid that, but there's also a need for a physical building or park or campus that helps facilitate those random conversations um, and those moments of connection with the company. 
um, the company is, you know, it's this huge ele ele element that, you know, if you don't come visit and be a part of it, you're still sort of observing it from the outside. And tech will do certain things to mitigate that, but the physical presence and the awesomeness of a building and facility still is going to be important to companies in the future. What are the range of disciplines at Studio O plus A? Architects, interior designers, industrial designers, and what has your own career path been like? So I'll be honest, I actually started doing space plans. I was more into understanding how to utilize space from a very, not mundane, but almost strategic facilities point of view. Um, spaces that I worked with in the few, in the in the early days were like they they got small, they got big, they contracted. We used things over and over again. We didn't buy stuff new. We just inventoried, and I think we should think about that as well. I think you know we can no longer just order all new. We need to kind of recycle, repurpose, reimagine things being used again. So we don't, you know, it needs to be sustainable. Um, I do think we at O plus A are, are very much our own like tinkering backs and lab. So I don't necessarily think, you know, designers, architects are great, but we also want to have other points of view. So we have what I would say, artists and residents. We have writers. Um, we have, uh, people have a lot of side things they do that inform their work. Um, so we want people to be very well-rounded because it is a global world that kind of we serve and we definitely want to be understanding of what's going on and, you know, workplace and design and while it's important we also want people to have other interests because they can bring that and bring those those other thinkings diverse thinking so i would say opus a is really the modern atelier it is a, an assortment of different points of view and different mindsets and then we all come together and do this very kind of what we call our process and create environments but with a with a, with a large amount of sort of, I would say, thinking as opposed to just getting Pinterest images and trying to, <laughs> there's, there's that kind of design DJ and then there's designing and they both come into play, but they're all very, very measured. So our process uh, is to be this collection of different thinkers. And then we run it through a really strong narrative sort of concept building process. And then we start designing it. So we, we do that first before we design. That certainly shows in the incredible work that the firm is putting out. Thank you. Are you seeing clients looking for different kinds of materials for the post-pandemic workplace, materials and textiles that are easier to clean or disinfect, for instance, or conversely, materials that are more cozy? I, you know, a, a little, I mean, of both, right? I think we're, we are concerned about the cleanability uh, uh, we, we learned that, you know, things needed to be washed down many times in order to make them safe. Uh, but we also kind of want to be responsible to the world in terms of sustainability. So, you know, not, you know, using virgin plastic, thing, things of that nature are just need to happen. We need to be very conscious of, are we really going to have to scrape this office back to studs in order to design it? Or are we going to work with what's there? Are we going to recycle product, um, always add new things that make sense, but also be conscious that we used to recover things. We used to rethink how can it be redesigned or reused. So I think a little bit of that will go a long way as well to the future. Um, we cannot design in the same way we designed in the past. We need to be thoughtful. Um, and they need to be healthy spaces. They need to be very, very much about, you know, is this a dangerous material or is this something that off gases? So those things are already very, very kind of known, um, but the whole recycle, the whole sustainability, uh, low carbon footprint in our building techniques, those all have to be looked at, at, at kind of like the highest level all the time now, because it's affecting the earth, it's affecting people. Makes sense. Do clients usually come to you with an exact idea of what they want for a project or do some give you complete creative freedom? You know, it, it depends. Uh, some people kind of have, you know, hey, we like this picture in your portfolio. And, you know, first thing we say, well, 
that's you're not that company <laughs> and that's how we want to approach it because you're you your uh, dna is different so it is almost as if you know the client for us wants to go into a deep dive and engage at a different level than just the what i would say surface level but really understand who they are so they are deeper engagements because you can see a space that has thoughtfully and done with love and care has a very different feel than something that has just been sort of kind of designed from a very, I would say, visual point of view. There needs to be the strategy, the storyline um, for people to bind with it, for people to make sense of it, and for people to align with companies. You, you, you have to be doing a lot more. How do you balance using responsible green materials with a budget? It is kind of a, a non-issue. You need to design that way. Uh, there are ways to work within a budget and still get very safe, very kind of sustainable techniques and material in a project. It's more the perseverance and the rigor you take in going into that, finding the way having good vendors, having good contractors, having a team that that's the mindset. How do you sell clients and their employees on the idea of non-working spaces like art and meditation spaces? Is there a fear of those being classified as unproductive? I think, you know, that's an excellent point that, but I would argue that work and the way we get to our best hours of work is a combination of those things. Um, there are, you know, it's proven that there's like a two or three hour zone that we are in our zone and we are working at the highest level of brain function. And it doesn't just happen like that. You don't just jump into the office at eight and produce. There's a run up to that. There's a cycling, there's a, a ritual that we do and everybody's different. To me, part of the ritual is having those moments of respite having those moments to be inspired by an art piece. Uh, we don't just work eight hours straight and it is, a, a, it is a coming up and down. So we cycle into those moments and the environment creates the cycle and you figure out what that cycle is and you go to it. So I would say that is very much a part of work and not really tangential, it's work. Excellent point. During the pandemic, how have your designers sourced materials and samples with many showrooms closed? We um, tried not to send them to everybody's home, but sometimes we had to because they weren't working close to the main office. We tried to have everything come to the office um, and then they go back to the office and they get packed up and they get shipped back to the manufacturer. Great. Well, we are just about out of time for today, but I do have one last question that I wanted to ask. Any yep. final words of advice or wisdom for the students tuning in today? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I can still remember when I was my first job and I was an intern and I worked in the library and I made coffee. And to me, it's like, you're a sponge and you need to continue to be a sponge and you need to learn to do everything. The design office is a multi-headed beast that has all different aspects. You need to know materials, you need to know how to write a transmittal, you need to know how to print stuff, and then maybe you get to design. To me, it's all a part of being a designer. The better you are at all those things, the more useful and the more contributed you will be to a practice. So be curious, be willing to do anything and be a student of it. Learn who the other designers are. Don't look at just O plus A, look at a bunch of firms and see what you like about them. And uh, there's a lot of great firms. I'm still, I'm like a like sports fan, I'm a sports, I'm a design fan. I know all the different firms and I love what they do. And, 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 and that can be very inspiring. So be curious. Great advice. Well, students, thank you so much for joining us today. If you wanna learn more about Studio O plus A, please visit o-plus-a.com. If you wanna learn more about the Original Americas, you can visit theoriginalamericas.com. Primo, I want to say a huge thank you for coming on and sharing more about Studio O plus A, the work that the firm is doing, and these incredible insights. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, original, the original team. It was fantastic. Awesome working with you guys.
Great. Thank you, everyone.